Welcome to China Tech Talk, a weekly discussion of technology and startups here in China. I am John Artman, editor in chief of TechNote, and as always, I'm joined by Matthew Brennan, founder of China Channel. So, Matt, we actually got a chance to meet as soon as we said that we hadn't actually met. We ended up meeting just a couple of days later. Just like magic, and so yeah, I mean, it was it was really kind of cool because you know we met at the、uh, at the the hub forum, and you know you gave it gave us a, a short presentation on on mini programs,、um, but for me it was really cool because it, it was、um, a bit of a background on kind of what's happening with marketing, what's happening with、um, content creation、um, in China, you know, targeting、um, a Chinese audience. Yeah, very very marketing focused、uh, event. I think they're quite big in in France. A lot of lot of lot of French marketers there. The French are very strong in Shanghai. Yeah, it was it was yeah it was a good event and、uh, good to finally meet up. This week we are、uh, continuing to talk、uh, about live streaming and influencers here in China, and we were very very lucky. Um, to get、uh, Lauren Hallinan on the show, who、um, who actually previously did a lot of live streaming,、um, got a lot of a lot of fans and a lot of viewers,、um, she's now transitioning a little bit into、um, away from live streaming, but、uh, she was able to give us some really amazing insight into how this industry works. Yeah, so Lauren has got、um, a, a sort of. Insider's viewpoint on what we were talking about in the last episode of all these influencers, KOLs, and、um, and live streamers、um, in this whole industry that's that's really really crazy has blown up.、Um, so much has been written about it, and everyone's doubting the numbers, asking you know the business model,、um, how many of this, how much engagement here is actually real, you know how much of this is.、Um, Are people really earning these crazy amounts of money?、Um, and she's in the middle of this. You know, she's been in the middle of this、uh, for a long time, and、uh, she has a very, very、um, unique viewpoint. I think because she's quite open.、Um, she's she's willing to say what she earns. She's willing to speak openly about the industry, and、um, she has the first-hand experience of doing this.、Uh, she speaks amazing Chinese. Um, she's got a fantastic story that we'll we'll go into later, and she's got a blog, and that's how I found her.、Um, she actually blogs about her experience doing this, and、um, it's not a well-known blog at all. I just discovered it by accident, and when I discovered it, I remember clearly that I was like, "Oh my god, this thing is gold! It really is."、Um, we'll have to put it in the show notes because her blog is gold, and.、Um, Yeah, she breaks down the numbers of what she earns month by month, and she goes into a lot of detail about what's happening here. Because I know if, if I was, in, you know, a lot of these live streaming platforms are,、um, you know, they're listed in the states. You know,、mm-hmm. they're big,、mm-hmm. big companies, and people are investing in them. And then, you know, pretty much their their business models have just completely flipped on their heads in the last year. And、um, and people, a lot of people are doubting this. You know, what what the hell is really going on here? Um, is this actually a thing, or is this just all hype? And、um, you know, Lauren gives us really, really good insight into into that.、Um, so she's not a big famous name、uh, for compared to some of our other speaker、uh, guests, rather that we have on the podcast. But I think、um, I'm 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 excited as as any of our guests to have Lauren on today. Oh, definitely. I mean, I would say that this is this is definitely、um, one of the one of the best conversations that、um, that that we've had so far. And 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 one of one one of my big takeaways was just kind of、um, how serendipitous, in some senses, her her experience has been because a lot of a lot of the initial traction that she got was、um, from being on Chinese television, and she'll tell us more about that. But I thought that was super. Interesting, and because she was able to leverage that into a Weibo following, and from that Weibo following to go into in, into live streaming, which is then you know kind of catapulted her into、um, what she what she's doing right now. And so it's kind of cool to to be able to talk with someone who、um, is actually an influencer, kind of how they how they've actually gone about it. And in some ways, it's a kind of an interesting mix of、uh, intentionally. You know, seeking to be an influencer, but on the other hand, also getting really lucky at 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 certain points in that journey. And she goes into real detail.、Um, she mentions a lot of platforms, so I can fully appreciate for those who are not so familiar with this industry, it might get a little bit overwhelming with the names. I think she goes into detail about four different platforms.、Um, but I think in the conversation. 
Uh, we'll again put those in the show notes. I think the um, yeah. the actual um, platforms, if you want to go up and look at their names and 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 a little bit find out a little bit more detail about each one of them. Um, but yeah, there's some real gold in here. She she goes into some really really interesting details about the industry yeah. that only people who are doing it will know. Exactly. Well, and with that, we give you Lauren Hallinan. So, Lauren, thank you so much for for taking the time to talk about um, your 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 live streaming career and what it's like to be um, an internet celebrity. Yeah, no problem. Glad to be here. So, um, so tell us, you know, start, starting off from the very beginning, you know, what's your what's your China story? Um, how did you you know, how did you come to China and, and how did you end up becoming, you know, um, gaining such a such a large following? Um, well, <laughs> it started off like a lot of people. Uh, I came to China or went to China to study Chinese um, during college. And then after college, I went back to China to keep studying and then stayed there to um, work. And I started doing biz de- business development for a startup company. And then <laughs> this is where it all got interesting, um, is that I was, you know, working at this startup and um, I randomly decided to apply to go on the popular dating show, Fei Cheng Wu Rao. I don't know. Do, you, do either of you know that show? Oh, definitely. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So this was, this was back in... Uh, 2012, 2013, I think. It was back mm-hmm. when Fei Chong Mural was really, really popular. And I just, as a joke almost, went to their offices and applied for the show. And they, they called me back a day later and they told me they wanted me on in two weeks. And so I had never been on TV before. I didn't like being in front of cameras, anything. And um, I was like, you know, if I don't do this, I'm going to regret it. It's, you know, just, it's such a cool opportunity. So I went on the show and it was like an amazing experience. Um, but when I was on the show, all the other contestants were saying, you need to open a Weibo account because if you don't do it, somebody else is going to use your name and pretend to be you. Um, and so you need to be able to control what, you know, what information is going about out about you. Um, so I was like, okay, well, I don't know what this is. And I opened up a Weibo account and I wasn't really into social media that much at that time. Um, I mean, cause yeah, this is 2012, 2013. And I, I was really worried about my privacy. I didn't really, I only occasionally sent stuff out on there, Um, which like now, (laughs) now I really, really regret it. Cause if I had, I was on the show for about three months or so, I did like 20 something episodes. So if I had actually known how to use Weibo back then and like really leveraged the opportunity, I could have gotten tons of followers. Um, But that kind of the the show and opening up Weibo and interacting with people was kind of sparked this huge interest in me in social media, especially Chinese social media. Um, and after the show, I got offers to be on lots of other shows, and I started um, even hosting some TV shows. Um, and did some radio as well. And so throughout that time, I was just trying to grow my Weibo and learn more about, about Weibo. No, don't take, take a step back for a second. So, mm-hmm. I mean, so, you know, your appearance on this, this uh, popular dating show, uh, the Weibo, other TV and radio appearances, this is, this is all being done in, in Chinese. Yeah, exactly. Your Chinese must be at a, at a, at a like almost native level then. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> I, 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 I hate, I hate saying, you know, I don't think I can ever say it's like fluent or whatever because Chinese is just so difficult. But yeah, um, I had pretty high level of Chinese. I think we need to clarify for some listeners, you know, Fei Chan Wu Rao. <laughs> it's a dating show. It's literally one of the most popular shows in China. Um, so if you're on Fei Chan Wu Rao. Yeah, you're gonna have millions and millions of people, um, you know, paying close attention. It's one of the few shows in China that the family will watch um, on TV. If you go down from like 
Beijing, Shanghai, all the way down to, to very, very rural areas. Everyone watches Feichuan Rural. And there's an increasing number of foreigners on there as well. I think it's one of the few shows that features foreigners on a regular basis. And um, yeah, so I can fully understand how Lauren would, you know, have had a golden opportunity. How many episodes again? 20, 30 episodes? 20 something, yeah. Wow, it was on okay. There. I mean, and unfortunately, like, I, I mean, oh, I look back and I'm just so... You know, it's kind of a regret of mine, but I got off the show um, partly because of work, because I was having to commute down to uh, Nanjing to film episodes of the show and kept having to take time off of work because it would be like uh, go down on a Friday and film several days and maybe come back on a Monday. And, you know, I just was having kind of issues with that. So I was like, oh, fine, like I'll, I'll, I'll try and, you know, get somebody to choose me and get off the show. And so I did, you know, and went back to work. <laughs> but, right. So yeah. during that time period, I think it'd be no exaggeration to say that Lauren would probably be, you know, one of the most talked about foreigners in the entire of China, because it's one of those shows that people talk about a lot, actually. Um, that's why it's so popular. Uh, that's pretty yeah, amazing, was... um, you know, pretty amazing opportunity. Yeah, I was... Um around the time that I was on the show and then probably at least uh, continuing a year afterwards, um, I would get recognized on the street daily, um, which was, was cool. It was, but it was a weird, a really weird experience to have, you know, uh, just, I had to start thinking like, oh, when I go out the door, I need to look okay because somebody might walk up to me and say, hey, you're that girl from Feichang Wurao and can I get your picture? And, you know, it was, it was, it was weird. Um, it was something that I didn't know, a, a world that I didn't know anything about, but it was such a good learning experience. Um, it was, yeah, really interesting. Um, but I mean, that's kind of how this whole interest in social media started for me um and and after after i was doing tv stuff for a while um like i said hosting and doing radio shows um but then i that's not very that's not a stable job so i but i really wanted to do something still related to this field so i actually started working for a large uh international pr firm and i did that for a couple of years and through that i started learning a lot more about uh, influencers and social media uh, and marketing in in China, um, and then and then I I got tired of you know I was we were hiring all these influencers for events and campaigns and you know I I was like. I want to be one of them. <laughs> like, I'm tired of, you know, I see how much money we're paying them, but really I'm the one sitting here, you know, creating their posts and writing their posts. And then I just send it off to them and they post it on their site and then we pay them. And I was like, but I, I can do that. <laughs> so I end ended up quitting um, the PR company and started trying to work on growing my own audience and, and everything. So that's kind of... Um, when I started to stumble into live streaming. And, and what was your, I mean, like, so when you, when you were looking at live streaming, I mean, how did you, what, how did you determine which, which platform you were, you were going to use? I mean, was there like a single one that you decided to do or did, were you, were you kind of on, on, on a few different ones? When I left the PR company, I, I wanted to be an influencer, but um, I was originally trying to start my own Taobao store, and um, and uh, so I wanted to be an influencer to be able to promote my store. Um, but then my store, I, I kind of realized that wasn't what I wanted to do later on. But 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 my original reason for starting to live stream was because I I heard about Periscope in the U.S. and then I saw the live streaming, uh, the mobile live streaming trend um, happening in China too and I thought that was a really good way to maybe promote the products um, so the first platform that I chose was actually um, Maypie because um, I felt like my target demographic um, was on there because I was trying to um, create a uh, like crafting um, like handmade goods um, store um, and there's a lot of girls on Maypai and they also have a lot of these kinds of tutorials um, but I ended up giving up the store because uh, <laughs> it wasn't really taking off and I was 
I was, you know, so focused on live streaming and I was gaining a lot of traction just live streaming and nobody really wanted to see, you know, crafting tutorials. They just wanted to see me live stream. So that's when I started also playing around with other, um, other platforms as well. I was on I was on Maypy for a while and I was getting pretty good traction there, but um... but Lauren Lauren I thought I thought that um, that Maypy was mostly mostly short video. Maypy has live streaming as well. They have live streaming. Um, yeah, they have a pretty big live stream. They started doing live streaming really early on, actually. Um, hmm. Uh, but yeah, they're known for short video, but that's kind of why I like the platform because you can live stream and put videos out and photos. So you can, and also, um, Maypi allows you to, um, do external links so you can link, they let you link to pretty much anywhere. You can link to Weibo, to Bilibili, to Yoku, to Taobao, to anywhere. So, I mean, the Maypi platform is really, really good. Because mm, a lot of these are walled gardens, um, yeah. In terms of yeah. where they, yeah, their ecosystem. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So Lauren, and you started the live streaming, uh, but you know your transition there. You've because uh, you know how I got to find out about you was from your blog actually, um, which is a really really fantastic resource. We'll link it in the show note. For for you know you you started off on some platforms and then transitioned over time. Could you you know just describe that transition of your your experience as a live stream in terms of the platforms that you've been using? Yeah, definitely. I've I've tried out quite a few of them. Um, so, like I said, the first platform I was on was Maypi, um, but this was before Maypi had a gifting feature. You know, like the tipping feature. Um, so it was purely live streaming. Um, and you couldn't earn any money from it. And so I was getting a lot of traction, but then I had um, you know, people reaching out to me saying, hey, these other platforms, you can earn money. Why are you playing around on Maypie? And so I was like, okay, well, maybe I'll try out the, the other platform and maybe I can do both of them. Um, because I did see a lot of advantages to growing an audience on, on Maypie as well. Um, so I went over to uh, Momo, and uh, a lot of people don't know that Momo has live stream either because Momo was originally um, like a social networking um, app with kind of a bad reputation. But um... <laughs> well, it's, it's, it's actually it's actually really funny that you mentioned that because um, in China, at least, you know, sorry, a bit of a, a bit of a side note. Um, in China, you know, live streaming and in video content in general has has proven to be you know the the killer business model for a lot of a lot of different um, existing businesses, and so Momo, yeah. as you mentioned, it was more of like a hookup or kind of like a date a dating app, um, but they weren't very profitable. In fact, they were they were actually declining. And then once they introduced um, once they introduced live streaming and other video content, actually the revenues have have gone up, and they seem to be a little bit back in the game. Yeah, exactly. So like you said, you didn't realize that Maypie had live streaming. Well, it does. And Momo, a lot of people don't know that it has live streaming, but live streaming is huge on there. So a lot of, yeah, a lot of um, apps and platforms have added live streaming as it's become popular. And um, I feel like nowadays a lot of platforms think that if they don't have live streaming, um, you know, nobody's going to use them or they're going to be out, you know, like like Chinese people like to say, it'll be out. <laughs> yeah, it's um, easier to show which platforms don't have live streaming now. Yeah, um, exactly. They, um, they all have it. And then on Momo's financials, I think there's there's a very nice post, um, perhaps it's a while back on, on Technode, written by Tracy, where she analyzed all the uh, financials for for Momo. Um, it's very, very clear that uh, if you go, if you look at that, we'll link it in the show notes again, like, the the re, you know the revenue that's been driven by live stream on these on these platforms once you look at the uh, the stats it's like amazing yeah definitely there's a lot of a lot of gifting um going on on moma um but that's also something i mean we can talk about the the revenue and the stats as well because i don't think they're all completely completely true but maybe we can <laughs> we can talk about that later on um but um 
Yeah, so I, I, I started going, uh, I started live streaming on Momo and because I had been recruited um, by an agency that was affiliated with Momo, um, so they were helping me to uh, get pushed onto the front page of the app and, um, and kind of, I guess, giving me advice um, about how to uh, be a live streamer, um, kind of coaching me a bit, I guess. Um, and so, and I was just curious, like, I, I just love like trying out all this stuff and learning, um, learning about it. So I was just taking whatever they would give me and trying it out just to see what happened. Um, and because of that, I, I mean, I was, I was growing. I mean, every time I live streamed, I was getting, uh, between like, you know, 500 to 2000 new followers each time. And I was just growing like crazy. And, uh, within, I guess it was like six months, maybe more, uh, maybe a little more. I had gotten to nearly 300,000 followers and I was making like, you know, a, a living, um, just from live streaming on Momo. But, um, but I kind of realized that it, that wasn't, it was, you know, it wasn't something that I wanted to do forever. And I also didn't feel like it was very sustainable. Um, just the whole model and the type of content and, and everything. Um, so I started to play around with, um, some other platforms and, uh, started to, um, try and grow audiences on some other places and diversify a little bit. Um, yeah. <laughs> so I've also, uh, live streamed on Idrabo, which is Weibo's live streaming platform and, uh, Hua Jiao, And, um, I've also played around on some other platforms, but I think those, four like Maypai, Momo, Ijerboa, and Hua Jiao are probably the four that I've spent the most time on. And you and you mentioned that um that you were able to to make a living off of um live streaming on on Momo. And so was that was that mostly like from from like virtual gifts or or you know how was how was that yeah. that revenue coming in? Yeah, um so I think any I think one of the most popular things that people like to talk about when they uh, talk about live streaming in China is this whole gifting model because it's really um, it's it's unique to especially um, yeah unique to China and um, so Momo is one of those platforms that actually you cannot get brand work on Momo, which is one of the reasons why I, I didn't want to keep going on Momo. Um, like we kind of mentioned earlier, um, how Maypai is very a very open platform. Momo is completely insular. They will not let you link to anything. They don't do, I, I don't think I've ever seen anyone doing any like brand work or advertising. It's just a purely live streaming, gifting grow your following there, don't take your following anywhere else, don't, you can't share your Weibo address, like, they won't let you post something if it includes the word, like, Weibo or Weixin in it. Um, so gifting is pretty much the only form of revenue when you're using a Momo live streaming. Um, but the gifting model is is really strong there, um, but I think that's also because... Um, of the demographics of the platform. Like we kind of mentioned before, Momo was originally uh, kind of used for dating. Um, and so there's a lot of single guys on there who, if they are interested in this live streaming host and they think that her live streaming is good, will send you lots and lots of gifts. And um, there's, there's a lot of uh, ways that you can talk to them and kind of get them to give you more gifts. So, um, I mean, and I, I was, the amount of money that I was making was, um, from, from gifts was nowhere near as much as, as there, there was a lot of girls on there waking, making way more than I was. Mm. So, so you mentioned, you know, all these, the, these four, these four platforms. And so, you know, as a, you know, from like firsthand, I mean, what would you, what, which one would you say that, that, that you preferred the most, which one was like the easiest to work with, or perhaps, you know, what you were able to create a, a better following on or, or any other uh, metric that you might be looking at? 
Yeah. Um, well, they all have their pros and cons. And I mean, there's even more platforms that I haven't spent much time on. Um, and I can, but I can pretty much go through um, with these four. Um, like I said, Maypie. Um, Maypie is really great because it is so it is so open. Um, now they've had they have added in a gifting um, feature, and people um, some some people are able to earn a pretty good amount from it. But I think the the gifting earnings are a lot lower on Maypie than maybe some of the other apps. Um, but brands really like to work with Maypie, especially um, there's a lot of um, beauty influencers um, or like fashion influencers that do work on Maypie. And Maypie is also really great because like I said, you can uh, include other forms of content as well. Um, so I really like Maypie a lot um, and I'm working on kind of uh, doing more on Maypie these days. And then Momo, <laughs> Momo is just really good if you want to make money. That's about it. Uh, there's not a whole lot of other advantages to to Momo. And Idrabua, I mean, Idrabua is awesome because Idrabua is um, part of Weibo, and so it's it's also so it's connected. People people will download the Idrabua app and they can find you just through that app. Or they can see you if they're on Weibo and they go to the live streaming section of Weibo. So Idrabo, you can get huge audiences because you're being put in front of um, being put in front of a lot more people than maybe some of the other apps. Um, so as far as audience numbers go, um, like my audience numbers are the largest on Idrabo, um, and it's pretty awesome because if people find you through the Idrabo app and follow you, they also follow your uh, Weibo account. So um, it can help you grow your Weibo following as well. And it um, it's like integrated in with Weibo. So it's really easy for them to watch your live streaming and then click on your um, your photo and be and go into your Weibo and see your other content. Um, but Idrabo is terrible for making terrible for making money. Um, it's not very good for tips. Um, but a lot of brands again are using are using Idrabo because it's connected to Weibo, um, so it makes it really good um, for for brands. Huajiao is very similar to Momo. Um, it's a little bit more open and it. Um, yeah, but as far as like the demographics and the type of streams that you'll see on on, on Huajiao are very similar to Momo. Um, Huajiao is really nice because it, they give you uh, a much larger cut of the gifts than all the other platforms do. Most of the platforms will give you about 30 to 40 percent of the gift's value will wow. be given to the live streamer. Um, but Hua Jiao gives you 70%. I was going to so, say like 30, 30 to 40% yeah. sounds pretty low. It is. Yeah. Mm. But <laughs> that's, yeah, mm. the, that's how they're earning so much money. <laughs> yeah. So Hua Jiao is really nice because you, you, you keep a lot more, um, a lot more money. Um, cool. Oh, but I was going to say, and another big difference with these with these apps is the um, the demographics one, and then two is the type of content that you're likely to see on these apps. So um, like Momo and Hua Jiao are going to have um, more males than females, and uh, the people on there will probably be slightly older, so maybe like in their uh, mid to late twenties to like their early thirties, probably. Um, the, the, the apps don't actually give me any demographics, but I can tell just from chatting with these people and like interacting with them and um, getting a lot of feedback from them that that's kind of the, the demographics that I'm dealing with. And then uh, for Maypie and Idrabo, you tend to get a much younger audience and it's much it's more even um, male to female ratio and you'll get a lot of like high schoolers and college students and recent grads. Um, and on 
uh, Momo and Hua Jiao, you'll probably see a lot more of those like pretty face type of live streams where you'll, you know, it'll either be somebody singing or dancing or just chatting. Um, maybe if it's, if it's a guy, cause there are some guys that do live stream on Momo and Hua Jiao and they'll probably be like doing some comedy or something, um, or maybe singing. Um, but then on Maypie and Idrabua, there'll be a lot, a much wider range of content. Um, people might be doing a lot more like outside, you know, going to visit some place or uh, showing how to cook some food or doing some uh, makeup or attending an event, you know, that kind of thing. There's, I think there's a lot more diversity as far as the type of content on Idrabua and yeah, Maypie. It's, it's, it's super interesting. I mean, just the, the live streaming ecosystem system in China is is so is so interesting in part because it's so different from what I've seen in the United States. I mean, in the United yeah. States, I mean, you have you have um, I mean, the biggest one is is uh, is Twitch. Uh, twitch.tv and and, it, and like twitch.tv is mostly for people playing video games. You know, people play video right. games and they stream themselves playing and um you know, there have been people who are, who are able to make a career out of that. Um, but and then and there are, you know, people who try to change it, change it up a little bit. And so, you know, oh, I'm going to live stream myself cooking or I'm going to live stream myself, you know, painting or something like that. But it's all based on on the desktop. And so it's the camera is almost always static. Um, you know, the, the person is more than likely in their home or in some other type of uh, professional studio. Um, but they're not you know, using their mobile phone to, to stream. They're not, you know, going out and actually doing stuff. They're just inside somewhere, you know, using their computer to, to stream. Whereas in China, I mean, all, like almost all of these um, live streaming platforms, they're all, they're all you know, mobile first. Um, I'm, I'm not even sure. I mean, like for Ijebo and these things, are there, are, are there desktop applications? Um, well, for a couple of them, there are. I mean, the most original, I mean, live streaming was huge. And it was actually kind of not huge, but it was big in China a long time ago, but it was the desktop live streaming. And the two platforms that were big were um, YY and Douyu. Um, and those two, YY is a lot of singing. And um, now they have mobile as well, but they, they have desktop. Um and then there's Douyu, which is, I think, a little bit more of an equivalent to Twitch. Um, there's a lot of gaming on Douyu, and um, they, I think they offer desktop as well. And then Momo actually offered um, desktop or mobile. So there's a couple of them that offer both, but I think mobile is definitely, um, as soon as there was mobile live streaming is when it really took off because the barrier to getting into desktop live streaming, you have to be like really wanting to live stream because a lot of them will buy like a camera and like, like you said, they'll kind of have some like equipment and, a, you know, make it look like a, a nice setup. And it's not as easy as just flipping open your phone and, and pressing a button. So they do have it, but it's it's not as big anymore. So Lauren, you know, when, when, I remember when I found your blog originally, um, one of the things that really struck me, I thought, oh, this is amazing because you were so transparent about how much you're making from these different platforms and the practices that were going on behind the scenes, which I think a lot of people know that there's, these crazy numbers going on with, <laughs> with live stream and everyone's so cynical about it. And I think what you provide is a really, really cool, really, really honest opinion uh, from deep within the industry, a voice that's often not heard. Um, so I just want to talk about that. You know, how much, you know, everyone's asking, you know, these guys, we hear these stories about live streamers making millions and millions and millions of yuan, um, having these crazy lifestyles. What is it really like? How much money can you actually make uh, from from doing this? Yeah, well, thanks for the you know the compliment. Um, I got that idea actually from a lot of the, I guess, popular online entrepreneurs that I follow in the U.S. Um, there's a lot of them that will list out their earnings, um, and I thought that was a really cool idea. Um, so I, I started doing that, um, and. Yeah, I mean, it's, I was making, you know, 
I was making probably uh, an average of anywhere between two to four thousand US dollars a month for a while there, um, which I think is pretty decent money for, for live streaming. Um, and I think I would fall. There's a lot of people that earn a lot less than me um but there there are uh there is a group of people that earn way 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 more than me um not, it's it's not completely true i mean they're earning that money but uh, not all of it is coming from their viewers um there's a lot of their money is probably coming from the agencies um so a lot of, you know, like I said, when, for example, when I worked on Momo, I was um, recruited by an agency that kind of partners with Momo to find these live streamers and coach them and kind of manage them and, you know, and um, so in order to uh, get me more views or to get me a higher ranking or things like that, and, and not just me, I mean, like, uh, get, get, you know, live streamers in general, these agencies will send in um, people who work for them um, and they'll have they'll pretend that they're just some normal viewer and they'll send the live streamer gifts and try and kind of get the gifting going because sometimes um, sometimes you you know you might be having a day where you're not receiving as many gifts and so they'll send someone in to start giving you a bunch of gifts and people will be like you know because it especially in China there's kind of that follower mentality right they see ooh hmm. this guy's giving her a lot of gifts so she must be worth giving gifts to like I need to compete with him to show off that I can give more than him and so they'll just kind of um, get this competition going um, but so actually a lot of these live streamers their their numbers might be really huge but a lot of that money is actually coming from the agency um, and sometimes they know this like sometimes they know who these people are and sometimes they don't even know like I um had an experience once where I had had an agency that I was, you know, they were like, uh, said they would support me. And then I was like, well, I haven't seen you supporting me at all. And the guy's like, Hey, do you remember this user that keeps coming in to your, your, your live stream? And I was like, um, yeah, like he, he's sent me some gifts, but he never says anything. And he's like, well, yeah, that's me. You know, so I didn't even know that the agency was like <laughs> sending me gifts, but they were, you know, like they, they were without like me even knowing. So um, I don't know how much is, you know, known by some of these people and how much they just turn a blind eye to. But there's definitely, um, yeah, some inflation with the numbers because, yeah, maybe they're earning that much, but maybe 50 percent of it is from the agency. So. Yeah, <laughs> that's and that's that's super interesting to hear because it, it reminds me of a, of a similar trend where like on on social networks, uh, you know, previously it was all BBS and forums and things like that. And now it's moved more towards social networks, including including Weibo, where, you know, there would be like this story that was going viral about something. And maybe people were complaining about the government or maybe uh, people were, were talking about something in a way that was a bit, you know, uncomfortable for um, for people in, in 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 the Chinese, the Chinese bureaucracy and so you have these group of people um, some are paid some are not paid but they intentionally go in they insert themselves into these conversations and try to and, and they actively try to change the direction of the conversation and so whereas mm -hmm. it might it might be about you know uh, food safety in in China and then they turn they, they they turn it around to being something about how you know how uh, food safety is really bad in the US or something like that um, and so it's really interesting to see a very similar type of practice. I mean, astroturfing, basically, um, see that see this type of practice actually happening in uh, in in a, in in the in a business sense, in where you know there's actually money on the line and money to be made via um, this this astroturfing. In China, there's a lot of businesses where there's practices like this. They, yeah. you know, anything when they're being sold. If you have a Taobao store, right, you're your um you'll get uh, <laughs> you need to get sales volume right so you'll right. you'll have fake sales volume straight away so you open your store people can see you've sold nothing so you get all your friends to go and buy it you drop the price to like 0 0.011 you know un something ridiculously low and then you get your friends to buy 50 of them and then you drop the price up again you know it's very very common practice um 
in, in all these kind of hacks and, and black hat techniques are very, very common on the Chinese internet. Yeah, so that's that's why I think um, there are definitely some people who are earning a lot of money, but I, I just it's it's very unclear how much of that money is coming from viewers and how much is actually coming from companies and, and, and agencies. And so when when we also look at some of these companies that are earning a lot from live streaming, it's it's kind of misleading because I don't think they I mean I don't know how they how how they calculate all of it, but I mean I think some of it is you know coming from these agencies that are working with them as well. So I don't think the profit numbers are necessarily completely True. I mean, I don't know. Though. Well, I don't even know how they even the it, even but. the even the user numbers as well. Um, I was yeah. I was talking I was talking with someone recently um, who had, who had been doing research into into um, live streaming, and uh, so he was trying out a, a lot of different platforms. And and one of the things that he mentioned was that like in Kua, for example. Um, which actually recently just 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 got bought. Um, in in Kua, what he noticed was that almost automatically, like he would get you know a couple hundred uh, viewers as soon as he started live streaming, but then there wasn't actually that much um, engagement. And so it seems to me that there's, and this is, this is, you know, zombie accounts um, are nothing new to the Chinese internet and certainly not to, uh, to social networks in general. Um, But I think this really does kind of highlight, you know, kind of what you were saying in terms of monetization, but then just in terms of like DAU or, or MAU, you know, numbers in China um, you know, you have to be you have to be pretty careful about you know how how big of a grain of salt you take whenever you know you take whenever you're um, reading about you know uh, such, like a, like really high GMV or you know really high MAU or DAU on on a, on a lot of these platforms. Yeah, and I think I think as far as that goes, um, I suggest that brands and companies that are hoping to work with live streamers, you know, I feel like there's a lot of money just being thrown around these days because live streaming is so trendy in China and they're not really looking into um, kind of all of the stats. And I really like highly recommend that they don't just look at how many followers the person has and how many views they get during their live stream, but how many comments they had during their live stream um, and like comments and likes and kind of look at it um, as a whole because sometimes you'll see this huge (laughs) like it just it just doesn't look right you'll have a huge number of viewers and then very few comments and that's obvious that they're they're not real real viewers you know Um, so I think it's definitely important for people to to look at all the numbers available one thing that struck me about the the numbers you put out for uh, how much you you earned is that it varied a lot month by month, mm. right? It seemed to be like the income sources between platforms was changing so rapidly for you. Um, is that still the case? And and can you describe you know how that fluctuation you know happens and why is such a uh, yeah. month by month your numbers in terms of revenue for different platforms can be so different. Yeah, um, well, that's because uh, probably kind of like the 80-20 rule, I'm sure you guys are all familiar with that. Um, I think in live streaming and gifting, I think that 80% of your money comes from 20%, maybe not even, maybe like 2% of your viewers. Um, So it really, how much I earned each month really depended on whether or not I had some, uh, like we say in China, some tu hao. Uh, you know, some rich friends. If I got some rich friends who happened to like my live stream, I mean, I had days where I could earn, in one live stream, I could earn several thousand RMB, you know, um, just because some rich person saw my live stream and, and liked it. Um, other days, I would have tons of viewers, tons of comments, and people would be sending gifts, but they're all tiny gifts. And and, and that's what the majority of your gifts are just going to be these tiny, tiny gifts that are just like, you know, a couple cents, and then they add up to a lot of money, right? Mm-hmm. But 
really where the big money is and, and, and what all the agencies will tell you is that if you get a two if you get a rich person, you, you need to hold on to them and keep them and keep them coming back and you need to make them your best friend. And that's how you're actually going to earn a profit. Um, so the reason that, that the numbers would change so much is because, you know, one month I might have a lot of, a lot of rich people watch my live stream and one month, the next month they're all busy working and traveling or something and they don't watch the live stream. So, or they just got bored of me, you know? So, um, it's uh, that's that's why it's so unpredictable um and that's also why um i'm kind of not doing this type of live streaming anymore i don't want to rely purely on the gifts it's just not really my personality um i don't like there's a lot of like tactics um a lot of you know being fake friends with people you know it just it just it didn't feel right to me and it's just not me um and and so i'm now kind of changing my direction um going on different platforms and trying to become more of a um an influencer um and hopefully uh, I've, I've i've worked with a couple of small brands but i'm hoping to you know develop more um brand work and be earning uh an income more from brand work and less from from gifting yeah do you think this gifting business model is sustainable in the long run because again, that's a question that a lot of people have. You've got all these people spending money, um, you know, gifting all these two house, gifting money um, to live streamers. But what do they really get back in return? And are yeah. they just going to be in the long run doing this for years and years, or is this a more short-term trend? Um, it's hard to say because China, you know, because the population is so huge that there's still people who are just getting onto live streaming for the first time, even though it's been popular for, you know, a, a, at least a year and a half now. Um, so it, it might last longer than I think it will, but I don't think it's um, sustainable. Like I even could tell in my time period when I was on Momo um, that, you know, a lot of these, uh, you know, big spenders uh, start to figure out that they're just, they're just wasting their money. Like they kind of get, I think some of them kind of get addicted to it because it feels good. You know, you're sending mm. these gifts and you're getting mm. all this attention. And then after a while, I think a lot of them just kind of realize that it's, it's all just, virtual and nothing is going to come of it. And it's, you know, it's not, it's not a real friendship. It's not a real relationship. It's just, you know, and, and I think a lot of them do it, um, to, to, to show off. Um, so I think maybe some of them will keep going because they just, you know, they, they buy fancy cars, they buy, you know, nice clothes, and then they spend a lot of money and they're known as one of, because on, on, on a lot of these live streaming platforms, you can not only see the rank of who are the top earning um, live streamers, but you can also see who are the top spending users, like viewers. Yeah. Um, so for a lot of them, it's just like a pride thing and and so i do think that might make it just, just a lot of people get really addicted to that you know so um it's kind of like gaming um so it might last a while but i just don't think it's gonna last for like the long term long term and you meant you alluded at one point that you know it's quite difficult to keep people engaged and keep them you know look coming back to your uh, live stream so Actually, you know, we haven't talked about this much, which is, you know, what is the content that you actually do? How, I mean, a live stream is a long period of time. It's a couple of hours. You know, how do you make this content and, and what is this content? What, what are you talking about and how do you make, how do you differentiate yourself from others? What do you, you know, what, what are you doing during this live stream? Are you talking to them directly? Are you, you know, how do you, how do you make it interesting for people? Yeah, I mean, what I was doing before is a lot different than what I'm doing now. Um, but I think before, um, you know, when I was focused mainly on Momo and the, the gifting model, um, honestly, it was 
I, I don't know why they were interested sometimes. I would just think that to <laughs> myself. Um, <laughs> because, I mean, I, I was, it was just like I was sitting down having a conversation with my friends, um, except for um, the difference is that, of course, I would always put on makeup, make sure my hair looked nice, put on a nice outfit, make sure the lighting was good. Um, <laughs> and I would usually have some background music playing and I would usually choose something that was more like pop and energetic. Um, and um, it was tiring because not only are you just talking a lot and reading all the messages, but I was always very positive and happy and energetic. and um, and we would talk a lot about, you know, just my life, but not all of my life, just specific parts of my life, like my dog or what kind of exercise I did today or what kind of food I ate, you know, that, those kinds of things. Um, and then a lot of it was about how, how do foreigners view China, a lot of foreigners' opinions on China, um, and then uh, just talking a lot about the U S and life in the U S and, and, and things like that. So it was just a, it was a, a lot of cultural exchange. Um, and so I think, uh, one of the, some of the reasons that I was so successful, um, were, were that, um, well on Momo, there weren't a lot of uh, foreigners. So I was one of the only ones, um, Another thing is that I was very consistent. I treated it like a job. They knew that I would be there pretty much every day at these times and like they could come find me. And that really, really helps um, with live streaming. Well, and how, how long? I mean, so let's let, you know, break it down like like per week, let's say. I mean, like how how many hours would you would you put into this? I was doing um, anywhere like five to six days a week. Uh, and depending, cause I was doing some freelancing work. Um, I was doing one to two live streams a day and each live stream would be anywhere from an hour to two hours long. Um, I typically did one around lunchtime and then one in the, e like early evening. And, and how much, how much preparation did you, did you put into this? I mean, you mentioned it was a bit of a conversation, but at the same time, I mean, did you prepare anything where they're like, you know, if no one's talking to me, this is what I'm going to talk about or, or something like that? Um, well, honestly, on, on Momo and a lot of the platforms, I've been lucky enough that I have so many people watching that I never have to worry about not having something to say. Um, because I like I can't even keep up with the, the, the comments that are going across this like coming up on the screen like I would finish my live streams and my my whole sometimes I would have to stop early just because my eyes and like my head were hurting from just reading because it's all in Chinese right and it's going really fast and then there's gifs flying across the screen and and, you know, and, and like, so I, I never really had a problem with trying to figure out what to talk about because there were so many questions and comments like on the screen that there was always something that I could respond to. Um, and people like that. Like, that's the thing. Sometimes I would plan a topic, like maybe there would be something really interesting going on um, and I would want to talk about that. Right. Or I would plan a topic ahead of time and people would just be like, stop talking about that. We just want you to answer our questions. Um, so <laughs> they actually, like, I think on, on platforms like Momo and Hua Jiao, um, they just want conversation. Like, they just want interaction. Like, and the more that you interact with them, the more that you answer their question, you call out their name, you thank you thank them for their gift. You recognize them like you're, oh, hey, you're here again today. You know, those kinds of things. The more money you get and the more people you'll get watching and the more people you'll get coming back. And they, they just, they want to be seen. They want that interaction. They want to know that you know who they are, um, which is tough to do with that many people watching. But um, whereas on some of the other platforms, it's, I mean, you, they still want that, but like, for example, on Maypie and Idrabua, people are okay with like 
you not answering their questions because you're showing them something cool. Like they're, 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 they, they want to see more variety of content. Um, so yeah, I mean, as I said, I tried planning stuff, but they didn't even like, they didn't want it. <laughs> um, but yeah, so you, you mentioned, you mentioned before that you're kind of in uh, a bit of a transition, um, going away, moving away from, from live streaming, being more of, um, uh, a KOL or, or influencer in particular with brands. And so, um, I mean, you talked a, l- a little bit about, about that already, but you know, why, why the transition and, and what are you, what are you hoping to do with it? Um, well, I think, um, one of the reasons we kind of touched on is that I don't really think that the gifting model is going to last for forever. And I also don't think it's like, for me, I don't think it's a sustainable career in the long term, um, especially because um, a lot of because of the things that people want you to say and the way that you need to treat everyone like your best friend and everything. It's just um, you. I can't really be myself and I can't really talk about the topics necessarily that I want to talk about. And I just felt like it was it was just a show. It was just a, a show and, and it wasn't something that I wanted to do long term. Um, and I think I, I have always been, well, not always, but for a long time, especially since I, you know, I used to work at a PR firm, I had been very interested in, you know, the influencer economy. And that's, that's, that's more of what I wanted to get into. I kind of got off track with um, going into the gifting live streaming, you know, I kind of got off of my original plan, which was to be more of an influencer. Um, But I think that um, having an area of expertise um, and being a you uh, being able to share your knowledge and it's to me it's more gratifying um, and it's something that I can see myself doing more for um, the long term I think it's more sustainable and um, I just uh, like I, I'm I'm focusing on mainly travel right now and I, I find it uh, like I really enjoy being able to um, film videos and take pictures and do live streams and show people a lot of places in the U.S. that they've never heard of before and tell them, you know, about different um, cuisine and different parts of the U.S. have different culture and this is what here looks like and there and, you know, and, and I, it's just it's 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 much more gratifying um, for me than than doing purely live streaming. Um, and I am still live streaming, but I'm not doing it, um, like, but, you know, I just mentioned, um, that I was doing it five to six days a week, um, one to two times a day for like an hour to two hours each time. And that's also just not sustainable. Like it's, that's, it's, it's just like a job, you know, you're trading your time for, for money. And I don't, I don't want that kind of job where I'm trading hours for money. I, you know, I want something that, you know, I, I do work and then I get paid a fee for that. Like that's more appealing to me. Um, and I think it's a better use of my, my time and abilities. Um, so now I'm, trying to incorporate a lot more um, video content and then maybe still live streaming a couple times a week. Um, And now I'm doing a lot more uh, outdoor live streams or planning specific activities. And um, instead of, you know, my followers knowing that I'll live stream every day, um, instead maybe I'll send out a post a day or two ahead of time saying, Hey, on such, such and such date at such and such time, I'm going to be live streaming, like almost like a, a TV show, you know, like I'll let them give them uh, a heads up and let them know when I'm going to be live streaming and what the topic's going to be. Um, and then they'll come watch. So I'm kind of, uh, changing the format a lot. Yeah. I was going to ask, I mean, so, so, I mean, how do you see the content mix kind of, kind of happening? I mean, like live streaming is going to be like what, 10, 10 to 20% and then like video is going to be 50, 60%, something like that. Yeah, definitely. I think now live streaming is more of a supplementary um, role and I I definitely want to continue live streaming because my, my, my followers and viewers 
really love that interaction and they love the rawness they love like we said you know me being able to call out their name blah 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 but um i i think uh that um live streaming being a live streaming influencer is very difficult because um i think that like we said, live streams in China are tend to be a very long amount of time. And it's difficult to fill, you know, if you're trying to do an hour to two hours and you're trying to fill that with good content the whole time and you're trying to do it every day a week, like that's just not it's just not sustainable. Um, so I would now I'm switching to a model where I, maybe I only live stream a couple times a week, but I'm trying to provide better uh, better content during that time. Um, and I think if I'm trying to work with brands, a lot of brands um, still prefer video because video um, it's uh, can get a clear professional message across in a shorter amount of time and it's very shareable um live a lot of people don't share live streams and if your live stream is uh you know let's say um for example, a live stream, if you're working with like a destination or a hotel, a live stream would be a really good option because if you're in the hotel and you're live streaming, then this product is going to be th shown throughout the entire, you know, hour to two hours. And then, um, you know, they, they know that everyone who watches this live stream, no matter if they watch at the beginning or they watch it at the end, that they're going to see what you know, see this cooperation, see this partnership and learn about this hotel, right? But um, if you're just talking about one product, you know, like a, a smaller physical product, it's, sometimes it's hard to use that for the entire duration of the live stream. And because the live streams are so long, most people don't watch them from beginning to end. They, mm -hmm. they come in, they watch a couple minutes, they leave, they come in again, maybe they watch mm -hmm. a couple more minutes, they leave again, you know, so, so yeah, maybe in your hour and a half live stream, you had a hundred thousand people watch, but how many of them actually heard the message and heard the product, right? So I think, um, sometimes there's some use cases where, um, where, uh, video is is much more much more appropriate. Yeah, and, and when and when when you say video, I mean like how long are we talking? Like two, three minutes, five minutes, something like that. Um, yeah, I do. I tend to do slightly longer, anywhere from five to ten minutes, um, just because I've been doing a lot of travel related, um, like more like travel vlogs. Um, travel related, so I, I tend to do slightly longer, but everyone seems to be watching them and liking them. So I think I think the time it doesn't really matter as as long as you're making it interesting the whole time. So Lauren, you know you're a foreigner, or as when we call it foreigner in China, long as you're <laughs> non-Chinese, right? That doesn't yeah. that doesn't make sense. Let edit that part out. Okay, let's start again. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna leave that in. <laughs> oh, okay, leave it in. Fine. Um, I am a foreigner. <laughs> You are a foreigner, yeah. That's what that's what we got referred to in China as. Um, but you're non-Chinese, and you're doing this on on Chinese platforms. How many people are there like you doing this? And do you have any friends doing this? And if so, you know, just could you talk a bit about their their experiences? What else are you hearing from other people? Yeah, um, I think there is. I mean, as the percentage of like. The number of people using all these platforms, it's a very small amount, but I think um, there is definitely more and more um, foreigners doing this. And um, I have started to get to know a lot more of them just because I think um, it's it's important for us to, to, to kind of share and talk to each other because um, our situation's a little bit different because we are foreigners and this is, you know, we're doing all of this in our second language in an environment that we don't completely understand. And um, so I actually started a, a WeChat community that um, I, you know, a lot of other foreign uh, KOLs, influencers have, have joined and we've been, um, you know, kind of learning from each other's experiences. Um, and there's a, a huge 
range. You know, there are some people that are just popular because of videos and there's some people that are just doing live streaming. There's people that do both. There's some people that are just getting into it and some people have been doing it for a long time and are like super professional. Um, so there's, yeah, there's a really, really, really wide, wide range of, um, of people doing it. Uh, I'm sure some of the of listeners, experience. there must be some listeners going, hmm, okay, I speak a bit of Chinese, perhaps I could <laughs> do this. You know, what would you, what advice would you give to someone who's thinking along those lines? I would say you really, if, if, if you want to actually make it into a career or to earn money from it, that you really need to make the decision to do it um, because all of these, the one thing that sh that all of these people in this group share is that we are consistently putting out content, you know, consistently, like all the time. Um, and like I said, if it's if it's live streaming, you need to be, you know, you need to be doing it all the time. If it's videos, you need to be coming out with videos all the time. You know, it's just, um, it's it's there's money you know there's money to be made there's followers to be you know Followed. had but it's just yeah i don't know how to say that i don't know where it's going with that but you know what i mean it's just you you have to really it's 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 not easy you have to put a lot of effort into it um and a lot of these platforms um especially like Weibo are making it harder and harder to organically get new followers so i would say um, if you are just now starting to get into the game that you, you might want to, uh, you know, there like Weibo is, you know, Weibo is the big player in, in, in China, but there are so many smaller apps that tons of people have never heard of, but they have millions of users and, um, you know, go on one of those apps and try and be, you know, the big foreigner, you know, the big fish in a small pond, and then, you know, see if you can bring them over to another bigger platform with you. Um, I know some people doing that on like, uh, there's Kwai Show and there's, uh, what's that other one? The, is it Koyin? Like the one that's kind of like musically? Um, mm, yeah, and another one you mean, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There, there are some. I, I don't know them, but there are some foreigners on there that have got like huge audiences because there's just not a lot of foreigners on there. Um, so that's another another tactic. Uh, so Lauren, if people want to find you, if someone wants to contact you, um, maybe a brand that wants to uh, you know work with you, or someone that wants to talk to you more about your experiences uh, with live streaming, with being a KOL in China, uh, what's the best way to contact you? Um, probably the best way would be through um, my blog that you mentioned, which is chinalivestream.com. Um, there's a contact form and, and my email is on there um, and I, I check that regularly. Um, and then if they want to, you know, check me out on Weibo, Meipai, um, they can look up my my Chinese, my, my handle is my Chinese name and then my English name. So it's um, Hao Le Ren, Lauren, um, and they can search me on lots of different platforms and, and find me under that name. Or they can Baidu me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, great. Uh, well, Lauren, you know, thank you. Thank you so much for for taking the time to to talk with us. Um, it's been a fascinating conversation and a really um, interesting look, an insider's look at, uh, at at what's going on with with live streaming and with uh, with influencers here in China. It's my pleasure. If you have enjoyed listening to this episode, we would really appreciate it if you took the time to leave us a, a review on iTunes or uh, if you are, for example, on Overcast, if you can uh, press the, the little star icon right there, that really helps us uh, grow our audience and it's a great way to show your support for this podcast. Mm -hmm.